face, like bubble face, I don't know. And I have a red motorcycle parked on this side of the road. Well, that's pink, but maybe it has daltonic uh, <laughs> issues. So, right. And then sometimes you really get catastrophic uh, things, like a dog is jumping to catch a frisbee. Oh, well, nope. A uh, refrigerator filled with lots of food and rings. <laughs> Maybe, you know, when you have American refrigerators, you open those things and it's very messy. So this is actually, you know, very messy <laughs> image. Then a yellow school bus parked in a parking lot. So here you can see some bias. Uh, usually in US, school buses are yellow. And given that there is a vehicle, yellow is like, ah, school bus. You know, it's learning still how to speak. Maybe it doesn't really have a clue what a school bus is, right? So, you know, it gets something very well, something gets not good, but again, we have a conversion between pixels, like intensities from zero to 255 times three, because you have RGB times, you know, whatever your grid of the image, and you are converting this kind of representation, which is a very high dimensional space, into a sequence of English words, which actually make even sense, although sometimes they don't describe correctly the scene, yes? So even in the worst case, we don't have gibberish. Yes, yes, that's the whole point. This yeah. guy learned a language model, right, by, by, for, for free. You actually learn how to speak by just trying to describe those captions for those images. So this is actually also very absolutely exciting, I think, at least from, from my perspective, yes? Is it necessary that the sentence that it returns to be like in this uh, form that it has like a verb? Huh? So, say again? I didn't hear. I mean, the, the, the sentence has like a, a verb in it, and some action. Yes. Is it something that you, you, you ask for it necessarily? Like if you just show grapes to it, will it say grapes sitting in a field or will it just say grapes? It depends on what is trained, right? So these are the captions that have been... So the, the, the grammatical structure of the captions is preserved when the, the network learns how to describe those images. So if you check this uh, data set, the COCO, the Coco, Microsoft Coco data set, you can check some examples and see um, in which form they are made, and then the network is going to be learning that way, right? Because if I teach you to speak in a specific way, then you're going to be learning that way, right, from the parent. So it depends on whatever you provide as a training samples. All right, so this is what the first application of those, those RNN. Is it cool, right? Huh? Mm -hmm. All right, let's see some more examples. So let's get back to this guy. Wow, so dark. And we see the second one. We had invert the, bless you. We had the opposite one. We have sequence to vector. So we start with a sequence of symbols, and then we output one vector. Can anyone think about an application of this stuff? Stock market prediction. For example. Or, but then maybe stock market, you'd like still to have multiple outputs, right? So maybe you want a sequence and then start outputting a sequence of future predictions. So it would be a sequence to sequence. Uh, I would think, I would think, have you ever used, uh, for example, uh, Amazon? You can read some reviews or uh, IMDB you now to see the reviews of a movie. And you'd like to know, oh, it's a positive review or it's a bad negative, uh, negative review, no? So in this case, here you can train a neural net in order to tell you whether a review is positive or is actually a negative, right? So you can understand, uh, you can create a network which is understanding English and trying to figure out whether it's a positive, uh, it's a positive uh, description or a negative one. Or another application is actually having a neural network learning how to compile a program. Let's see how that works. So you have an input here. For example, I start with j equal 8,594. Then I have 4x in range 8, uh, j plus 920. Then I have b equal some uh, you know, additional 1,500 to j. And then I print my b uh, plus 7,567. 7, and then my target, which I compile with you know, proper a compiler is like uh, 25,011. And I try to train my network after having inserted j equal 858 for a return f o r space blah. So this is my whole sequence of characters and symbols. Then I have my output, which is going to be to 5011 dot. So in this case, we learn how to execute a program. It's crazy. You don't need even more a compiler. You just have a neural network figuring out the correct output of a, you know, um, 
program, or maybe um, you can even put like mathematics. You can put some LaTeX, and it's going to tell you the output of your computation. So this is crazy, I think. Uh, for example, here the same. We have an input. Uh, I is whatever. C is going to be a function of I. Then print some kind of uh, conditional statement. So it's going to be even learning condition, <coughs> conditional uh, relationships. And then my target is this guy here. And this stuff actually works, and it's really impressive. We have neural networks which are actually making computations, and maybe they are like, you know, if they don't get it right, they still get in the right uh, ball per, ball, ballpark. So it's like physicists, you know, you, uh, you have good intuition about the order of magnitudes of some operations. You don't perhaps know exactly the, name, the number, but you know roughly what it is. And this guy, if when it doesn't work, when it doesn't really give you the correct answers, give you something that is, you know, you know, rough estimate of whatever you are trying to com compute. Yeah. So can we have the output of that be a, just a Boolean whether or not the program halts? Uh, for example, <laughs> yes, yes. So this is what my friend, maybe uh, they are doing at Microsoft. Uh, they have some uh, some uh, recurring neural net running over the code and trying to predict, for example, the uh, how to complete maybe the next uh, uh, the next like uh, call to a. Yeah. Uh, no, that's not that's not what I was asking. Uh, oh, okay. If you can look at a, if you train uh, an RNN to look at a program and just, and say yes it will halt or no it won't halt because formally that's impossible. Formally. Maybe you can try empirically and see if it works. Yeah, empirically. You uh, can check the correctness of the abstract syntax tree. Maybe that can stop. Well, I mean, give it abstract syntax tree would be easier than giving it raw text. But, but e either, even still, you know, that's, that's a formally impossible uh, thing for an algorithm to do. And it'd be interesting if, uh, if, a, if an RNN gets it right like 90% of the time. So you know what, I'm so interested. I'm going to be looking forward to uh, see your results if you try it out, OK? Uh, today we are going to detect bugs, actually. Yeah. Okay. Nice. yeah. Um, so then let's go back. Like, so this is second application. We have two more applications. You know, are you excited, right? It's so cool, this stuff. All right, that was sequence to vector and then vectors to sequence. What is left? Well, what our, your colleague was suggesting before. We have sequence to vector to sequence. So in this case here, we are basically getting some input here. Then we are condensing it into a internal representation over here. Then we bam, expand. So we have an encoder in this case. Are there questions? No, OK. So there is an encoder here where we have a sequence condensed down to a concept vector. And then from the concept vector, we have, again, an expansion, again, into the sequence domain. So we have sequence to vector, which is compressing the knowledge of that sequence and then bang to another sequence. And this is crazy because, uh, for example, you can go from English to Chinese, and then you actually learn how to summarize English, sent English sentences with just one concept. Then you just remove this one, you plug in Italian, and this guy is going to start speaking Italian without having ever had to learn English before. So given that you learn a pair English to Chinese, then you, you can just switch this to uh, Italian. You can switch this to Chinese. You, then you speak Chinese and English, Italian. You do all the combination. This stuff is really like uh, versatile. You can swap and change, and everything just works. It's really good. And this was, yeah, sequence to vector, condensed representation to back to sequence. All right, so in this case, we have here some examples. Uh, here I'm showing you the uh, like uh, 2D uh, dimensionality reduction over the condensed version, like the concept uh, vector, after we collapsed that sequence into a vector. And then you can see here, for example, there are a yellow cluster, and there is a blue cluster, and a green cluster. Let, let's zoom in. So uh, the green cluster, we're representing all the names of the uh, mounts. So no one told the network, oh, mounts are something that are uh, swappable, but then the, the network figure out that every time the sentence is written in a specific way, uh, it doesn't matter which kind of mounts you put there. So all the representation of these different mounts are all close together because if you swap them, they don't really change much the structure of the, of the sentence. They change the meaning, but they are interchangeable, I would say, in the, in the sense of like having a proper sentence. Uh, the other one, the other cluster were, was this one. So all the time, uh, related uh, sentences like uh, one to three months, two days before, for nearly two months, 
Uh, so the number two here is recurring over the last two dec decades uh, of two groups. So, so everything here uh, that is expressed in some time uh, lapse is collapsed in this kind of same region. And the nice part is you can also do the difference of this one. You can see how much time is lapsed. So the difference between this and this one is the same as, I don't know, maybe this one and this one. So the, this, the metric in the latent space is also uh, correspondent to the metric, somehow, somehow some kind of metric in the actual uh, in initial space, right? So it's really great. And oh, oh, sorry, sorry. And then there is the last application. Uh, oops. And then the last one, which is this one, sequence to sequence. You start inputting something, and then this guy starts outputting something. So, for example, you may have you watch a movie, uh, but you're deaf. You cannot. Here. So you can have a neural network that is, while it's listening to the audio, it starts splitting English. You start reading the conversion of the English. Or some other example is going to be your, uh, I used to call it T9, uh, if you had a Nokia, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, you had like an autocorrection. Well, you have similar things now, right now, but they work a uh, different way, a little bit. But here you can just start inputting your text. And this guy is just, just going to try to mess with you. No? You write something, it's going to write duck. I didn't want to write duck. I was, said, I was saying something else. But again, uh, duck is more safe word to, to write whenever you write not duck. Um, so again, here, as you input some sequence of uh, symbols, it starts outputting immediately some other sequence, which are like the best guess about what, is, what you're trying to write. Or you can do even more fun. So let's say you are writing a book, but you're lazy, you have no idea, you have a very bad imagination. So let's have a recurring neural net actually suggesting you the plot of your book. Let's see. So here I'm writing the rings of Saturn glitter while the harsh eye two men look at each other. Mm. So excited. <laughs> they were enemies, but. The servo robot, no, 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 no. Right. whatever, right? The, the, the guy got a little bit excited and I started playing with robots. Because I've been training this on the, uh, some science fiction, so he, he likes robots and, and, and things. All right, so this was just to give you like some motivation about uh, why you should be very, 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 very interested in playing with these guys, because they're absolutely powerful. You can do so many things. You can even read how people write with calligraph calligraphy. You can even have a network writing with calligraphic way. So I'm inputting text in Word. I don't like the way it looks. It's very impersonal, right? So I just they say convert, and it writes like with perfect way of uh, you know writing, and it's gonna be all letters different. They never write twice the same letter in the same way. So this is really good stuff here. All right. So let's see RNN training. How do we train this stuff? Well, with something that is called back propagation through time, or BPTT, it's kind of the shortening. All right, so um, how does it work, this stuff? All right, so let's start again uh, with the vanilla, uh, you know, neural net, multi-layer perception, the stuff we have been seeing uh, multiple times so far. So we have the input, the hidden representation, the y hat, my prediction, the, those matrices, and the nonlinearities. So again, my, let's say, input uh, belongs to RQ, the H, the hidden representation to R, and the Y to S. So again, we have the, the uh, hidden representation is simply an affine transformation of the input plus a nonlinearity, and the same for the output, right? So it's just repeating again, again. And this can be thought like if I have my phi for function, my neural network function, it goes from my input to an internal representation to my output. So what's the difference here? Uh, we have to deal now with the, we are, we, what's the difference so far? Now we have H of T, no? there are square brackets. So these are representing sequences. No? So here I have my X and, and my input X or X of T, like a sequence of X's. Here I have a sequence of internal representation. And then here I may consider like a sequence of outputs or maybe just the last output. You know, I just drop the first output. So, and these are uh, simply how I start. So instead of saying H, was like a, a fine transformation of my input. In this case, my H is a fine transformation of the concatenation of the input and the uh, uh, previous state, right? 
So I just get my internal state, I get my input, I stack them one on top of each other, and I do exactly the same. So I just reuse this guy here uh, inside. Uh, one should say, oh, how do you start? Well, I set my initial state to be perhaps zero. And then here my matrix, WH, is simply the concatenation of the two matrices, the one that is mapping the uh, internal representation, the, the input to the internal representation, and here the other one that is mapping the internal representation to its own representation. And then I have finally my prediction, which is going to be the nonlinearity of an affine transformation uh, of the uh, hidden state. Right? So nothing new here. You can see the equations are basically the same, but instead of having just the input x, now I have the concatenation of the two. And here, instead of having my wh, my wh, well, it's still wh, but it's like a concatenation of two guys, right? So this first row, it goes like here. Uh, so like first row goes first bit, and the, this row here, it gets down to the second bit, right? So when you concatenate, it's like having the summation of this one, and, and so this one times this one plus this one times this one, <coughs> right? So do, do you understand what we are doing here? Yes, no? Yes, I cannot see you. You're dark. Those, okay, you're making noise. All right. So, all right. So this is my equation. No, one, one, one little change. This is just a concatenation here. All right. So, how do we train this stuff? Well, to train this stuff, we uh, so there is no magic in this relationship. This is not exactly happening right now. This is simply saying that the current uh, input here depends <coughs> depends on the state at the previous time. So if we start somewhere, we can unroll multiple times, whereas my input here gets the current input, xt, and gets its x uh, ht minus 1 coming uh, this way here. And then here I have simply my output with the affine transformation, right? So the only thing here is that instead of having just input coming in at this time, it, I have some input coming from the past. And then I have an output which I will provide to the next iteration here in the future. Here again, I have my input. I have an output coming from the past. Then I perform my uh, input, my 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 here, my passage here, okay. And then at the end, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just try to enforce this guy here to match my final sequence or my final representation or whatever we are trying to do. So no, no big mystery in how to train this recurrent neural net. Although you can see here, there is a connection between the output and in the input, actually there is no such connection. This is a temporary connection. Here there is like a delay uh, module, right? So the connection happened from the previous version, the previous time step. So it's, no, it's not a big deal. Good so far? Yes? All right. Uh, let's go on. So let's, let's actually see an example on how to train this stuff. Uh, for example, we'd like to model a language. So let's see, let's say you put some C code, you'd like the network to learn how to program in C. Or you put some English, you'd like to, the network to figure out what is the structure in the language or whatever. So you have a sequence, you'd like to learn more about that sequence. So how would you do so? If I'm saying, uh, today was a rainy, what's the end of my sentence? Afternoon. Perhaps, right? Or today was a rainy day or rainy morning. Uh, but you already can figure out what, is, what are the possible outputs, right? So what are we going to be doing here? It's going to be just training a neural network in order to predict the next symbol in a sequence. And this task is going to be basically enforcing uh, some kind of you know, learning to the network. So the network has to actually understand the structure of this kind of uh, sequence. All right, so let's see. Uh, we have a sequence here. Uh, where each of these symbols may represent a symbol. Uh, so every letter here, sorry, every character may represent a symbol. They may be letters in a word, they may be word in a sentence, they may be a values in a stock market, they may, they may be, you know, you, 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 you name it. Uh, you name it, it's okay. So first thing we have to batchify. Why do we have to batchify this stuff? Because if we are uh, working with batches, we can accelerate the processing time. Uh, instead of just doing one operation at a time, we can perform multiple operations at a time. And since you already took some courses here, uh, you know that if you perform vectorial operations, you know you can go faster. So in here, we just split. You know, I have my uh, sequence, A, B, C, D, E, F, 
here, and then I just cut it down, and I have the second part here, and so on. So in this case, I, I'm going to be performing operation on AG and MS, and I will try to predict B, H, N, and T. So given that I have A, I try to do get B, G, and H, try, I have M, and I try to do N, and I have DS, and try to predict uh, T. Okay. So this is the batch uh, ification. You can find the full example at this link on the bottom. All right, so... And then in your second, uh, whatever, parallel iteration, you will use like CIO, you will use that, which was, is that why you broke it? Yeah, so I, this is my input. I'm going to show you in the next slide. you break it, don't you lose a little bit of sequentiality? Uh, I'm going to lose exactly one, two, three, uh, one, two, three sequence uh, information, yes. I thought one, two, like, you know, because connection between S and C is broken. S and C. Like, in the, in the example, it's like they're all after each other, right? Yes. When you break into batches, every, the connection between batches, is there. That, that connection is broken. All right, so let's say this one is long 1,000 characters. I divide it in four different sections. So it's going to be 250 long strings. So it's fine. You have a few. So this, okay. this, you can think about the sequence be like 10,000 characters. And you're going to just have 2,000 and 500 long sequences. So yes, you're going to be losing some information, but it's uh, negligible. All right, and yeah, this was the batch size here. here. So you decide what is your batch, and you stack those many columns. So we get first, this is going to be my x, 1 to t. Uh, so I have 1, 2, and 3 in this case. Huh? This is my temporal batch. So t is the temporal chunk, whereas this one is the size of the uh, the batch of so how many computations I do at the same time. So that was my uh, BPTT period T, capital T. So that's my chunk uh, temporal size. And this is my input X. Uh, below, I have my output Y. So given that I provide A, G, and M, S, I will try to predict B, H, and T. Given that I provide B, H, and T, I will try to predict C, I, O. U, and then last one, I provide C, I, O, U, and then I try to predict, predict D, J, P, V, all together. So here I can capture relationships that are three uh, ways apart. All right, so let's see how it works. So here I have my first element, A, G, M, S. I feed it inside my neural net, and then I say neural net, okay, you have to force your output to match this uh, sequence here. Okay, it's gonna try to do some something. Then I'm gonna have the second uh, second sequence, right? I feed it to the network, but first I'm gonna get uh, the hidden representation from the first guy. I feed those two guys to the second replica of the same network, right? So they are is the same network, just a time step later. And then here I'm gonna try to force hey net, just try to predict. Uh, Xiao, 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 don't know, whatever. Uh, then again, I have the third sequence, or whatever, the capital T, the, the temporal chunk, the temporal uh, back propagation, uh, temporal interval. I have this input, I, pr I get here the representation of whatever was my system in, and then I feed inside the neural network and I enforce here uh, my output to be the last one. By performing this kind of training, the network is going to be uh, refining its own capabilities in predicting the next uh, sequence of symbols. And in this way, the network will learn a representation of a language. So, uh, in here, we have a final HT, but I have a bar here. So, before, when we were training this guy here, I, when I fix these guys here, I'm going to have some signal coming down here, which is my gradient. So my signal comes all against the arrows direction. So when I force a loss on this guy here, I have one arrow that goes down here, one arrow goes down this direction, down here, an arrow goes down here and follows this direction here. Then I have one vertical guy here, and this guy goes down here, and then I have vertical guy here. So you can think, ah, oh, why? Okay, I just put all my sequences, then you're gonna have memory overflow. Because you, every time you add things, this thing is just increasing the, the magnitude of your uh, computational graph. So sometimes after a bit, you're going to be running out of memory. So at the end here, I have to say, oh, here, stop the gradient. 
here I don't want to track anymore what happens next. So I just store the value, but I stop the gradient. I don't want, having, don't want to have any kind of gradient coming from the future. <coughs> the same way here, I will also have an initialization of the initial uh, state, which maybe it's just zero because we just started. And also here, we don't send any gradient to the past. We have to decide to chop off a fraction of my data. Otherwise, this stuff becomes you know, very uh, large. And this is how you train a uh, recurrent neural network for language modeling. So you just learn how to express a sequence in this way. Is it good so far? Did you try, did you follow? More or less? Yes, make yes with your head? Very good. All right. So in the last part here, uh, and then we are gonna be having some exercises uh, and fun with the notebook so that you can actually have hands-on experience uh, and, and you know, you're gonna maybe uh, able to re recycle those, uh, th those, uh, those code for your own uh, application later on with the notebooks. So before going to the notebooks, we are gonna be seeing uh, one more architecture of those uh, recurrent neural network, which are trying to solve uh, some problems. So uh, we are going to be talking now about long short-term memory, uh, which is a specific way uh, of implementing a gated recurrent neural network. So what I'm talking about here. So sometimes you're trying to get uh, some, let's say, uh, information here. Perhaps from, you'd like to find out something that happens between this symbol here and this symbol over here. So there are so many symbols happening uh, in before. And so there is some uh, possibility that the network, you put A, okay, that was a meaningful symbol. Then you see so many things, it actually forgets about A. And when you arrive at the Z here, ha, huh, did I see an A? I don't remember. I saw so many other things. And I always have to keep in mind what happens before because I, I have an internal state which is dependent on the previous input. So it's, it's, it can be, actually, it's very likely that after uh, some amount of you know, uh, length of your sequence, you start losing uh, memory about what happened, really. You know, did you remember exactly the first slide I showed you here the first day? OK, because it was so pretty, right? But that's good. Uh, good. But you know, maybe you start forgetting things you learn in undergraduate. Yeah, so. I know, that's what I try to do. So it sticks in your mind. <laughs> Um, the yeah, but they actually, they, 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 that is the point. I'm trying to, you know, build some long-term memory in your mind. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's pedagogical stuff. All right, so the point here is that if you just use this kind of very easy uh, version of this recurrent neural net, you're going to be losing some track of, you know, long-term dependencies in your data. So someone has to do some, you know, uh, come up with some other kind of memorizing things. In this specific case, we're going to have just a switch which is going to be, oh, just remember about that and keep it apart. So we are going to be introducing those switches or gates. And these gates are letting me store information for long-term retrieval. Retrieval, I don't know how you say it. Retrieval, I think. So you can just store in little pockets. You just say, OK, I store this for later reusage. Like whenever you have to do an exam, you copy those formulas on your hands you know, for later reusage in, uh, in the exam so you don't forget whatever you were trying to do. All right, but you don't want to cheat, right? All right, so long-term short memory or LSTM. Let's see how it works. So that was my uh, question for the uh, vanilla, the, the plain recurrent neural network. We had the... Um, the, uh, out the in, uh, hidden representation is a fine transformation of the concatenation of the input and the previous hidden representation. And then the output is the same stuff we have seen all the time. The fine transformation of the hidden representation with the nonlinearity. So a nice drawing of these equations is the following. So here you can see my input and the concatenated previous state goes inside a TH, which may be like a hyperbolic tangent. And then I have my, for, for the nonlinearity, and then I have my HT, my current state. Then I have the HT fed inside another hyperbolic tangent, and then I have my output, you know, through the affine transformation in between with the arrows. Okay, so no, no new, no, there are no news here, right? And is it cl clear, right? So the only difference between this one and a, a normal neural, neural net is that you don't have this concatenation part. Everything is just the same. 
Is it okay, right? You understand this diagram? Because I'm gonna show you something a bit more scary right now. Don't be afraid, don't scream, uh, don't run away. Just stick with me because I'm gonna try to explain this thing. <laughs> okay, don't, don't, don't even try to read. It's unnecessary. I just put it there for reference. I just wanted to scare you a little bit. <laughs> All right, so this is the diagram. Okay, the diagram is also a bit complicated, but it can be explained with colors because I like colors. So let, let's see how it works, okay? Uh, it's, but again, those balls here, they represent non-linearities, and the arrows represent a fine transformation, and this big ball dot is the element-wise multiplication. So we have element-wise multiplication, summation over here, and then we have non-linearities around here, okay? But again, the input is gonna be the concatenation of my input and the hidden state, my output here is my, I have my state, current state. I have some C, which is a memory cell. And on the other side here, I have my previous C. So I have a cell, memory cell, which is different from my internal state. So I have an additional memory cell, which I'm gonna be using. Okay, so far? So very similar to this one. Similar, similar balls with different nonlinearities. These are hyperbolic tangents that they go from minus one to plus one. These are sigmoid going from zero to one. And so these are my switches because zero means I turn off the switch, one <coughs> is on the switch. This guy instead goes from min minus one to one, plus one to represent the full uh, tense, whatever the full representation. Okay, so far, is it clear uh, the, what those uh, symbols represent in this diagram? Yeah. Can you just repeat that again? Yes, of course. So where you find here? Yeah, yeah, I was fine there. I so just these ones are the switch part. yeah. The, the balls represent nonlinearities. Th stands for hyperbolic tangent, but it was not able to write. I was not able to write it all in the ball. Um, and the lines uh, represent affine transformations. So the same happens here. Balls and lines, same meaning. Uh, we have also element-wise multiplication with the big dot, and then we have summations. So we have two more operator. And the other one is the difference that I have a sigmoid here. And the sigmoid goes from zero to one. Whereas the hyperbolic tangent goes from minus one to plus one. It's like a rescale uh, uh, hyperbolic tangent, basically. No other differences. Same kind of input, concatenation of input and previous state. Concatenation of input and previous state. The output is my h here, I have my h here. And then there is an additional wire associated, associated to my Memory, internal memory, which is where I store my information. It's like a secret uh, box where I put my nice things, okay? So far, just this I want to, you to understand. There is a very scary equation here, sequence of equation I don't care you read. And here I'm just showing you some additional blocks. Nonlinearities, affine transformation, multiplication addition. Right, good so far, everyone? So a sigmoid is kind of like a switch where it can be zero and one? Right? Uh, sigmoid it goes, is the classical logistic sigmoid. The, it's like the tan h, yeah. where the minus one part is actually at the zero. So from zero goes to 0 0.5 in zero, and then uh, plus one, right? I just mean like a signals processing, like look at it. Like if we were to do this in terms of like an electrical like uh, diagram. Uh, if I, that, it, it could be 0.5. Yeah, it could be 0.5. Okay. 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 No, it's dark. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> All right, it's just uh, it goes from zero to plus one. Whenever it's minus below minus five is zero, above plus five is one, and in between goes like linear, and in the center is 0.5. It's like a it's a non a nonlinear function. Very it's basically the same as a uh, bless you hyperbolic tangent where the minus part minus one part goes to zero. Okay. All right. So the, yes. Is the dimensionality of C is that? It could be anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be same as the number of h, uh, h dimension. Uh, it, yeah, it is usually it's the same number of h because I'm gonna be so h is just the uh, dot pr uh, the, the element wise multiplication between those two guys. So they are, yeah, c and h have the same size. But again, details not not interesting. Not not in, not uh, it doesn't really matter right now. 
All right, so we have the first part here where we have a input uh, for our, this, this is what you, what you want to remember. So we have an input module of our system. The input module deals with the, uh, I'm gonna get some more information in my memory, or I don't get new information in my memory. Then I have a don't forget block. If you read any article or any blog post or any talk or anything, you're gonna hear about, oh, the forget module. No, that's the non-forget module. They got wrong the uh, logic, the Boolean logic. It's opposite, it's upside down. Anyhow, non-forget block. So this is the block that decides when you don't want to forget information. And everyone is gonna call it forget information. So that's why it's called F for forget. But this is actually a bar on top, not forget, right? This, I'm so annoyed. I, yeah, there, is an, there are other issues with this field that get, got wrong other things. But anyhow, that's the non-forget thing, which is basically the block associated to the information you don't want to forget, right? So this is what you want to take note about. And the last part is the output block. The output block will, uh, decides what information you'd like to take out from your memory and provide it to the output. So the yellow block, the input block, decides what you, would, what you want to store from the input sequence in your internal memory. The purple, uh, whatever, pink block is what it decides if you would like to keep in memory or forget about whatever you are, uh, have input before in the memory. And then the green, sorry, the blue one is deciding whatever you'd like to provide to the uh, output. Finally, there is some similarity to the initial guide there where we are uh, creating our prototype for our memory. And then there is a final part for the, the output there, which corresponds to, namely to this part. But just to show you the similarities of the two equations. Again, don't pay attention to those equations, just check about the diagram. Input, uh, don't forget, output. Okay? <coughs> yes? There has to be a Y output, uh, I don't see it here. My output is gonna be H in this case. So my H is my current output. The notation is this one. Uh, so yeah, there is no such block here. My H is considered output. If you'd like, okay, if you'd like a final output, you can add here a additional uh, linear, okay. uh, like additional blob, like this one. Yeah. You can have it at the end. But usually what is done here, you um, stack multiple of these blocks together, and then only at the end you're gonna have the final output, uh, you know, conversion. All right, so far, not questions related to the, to the equation, but questions related to the three main blocks here. No questions? All right, so let's see how they work. Are you excited? Yeah. Oh my God, seriously, that was your excitement. All right. <laughs> okay, at least you're listening, good. All right, so let's see how it works. Uh, controlling the output. Uh, let's say I'd like to turn off my current output. So whatever happens in the input, whatever is in my memory, I just like, uh, I don't give you anything. I just give you zero. I don't want to give you any information. So how we turn off the output? So let's say uh, my uh, sigmoid are saturated. So we are working in the plus five uh, and minus five uh, interval, right? Above plus five, we said it's plus one, the sigmoid, and below minus five is gonna be zero, right? So we are in the saturated regions for sake of explanation. Uh, the network is gonna be learning automatically how to bring its values in those ranges. So again, green is gonna be my one value for the sigmoid, red is gonna be uh -uh, zero. All right, so let's say I have a internal representation, my uh, basically final, uh, whatever the color there, the purple there, that's my internal representation, my internal information. Uh, but I don't want to give it to you. I'm greedy, I say, all for me. My treasure, my, how is it? Is it treasure, right? The, the golem. My precious, right, that's my. <laughs> all right, so I say a uh, uh, red flag on the sigmoid there. So given that I perform a element-wise multiplication, I just write zeros on that kind of multiplication and I give you nothing, red, okay? So uh, if I turn off my sigmoid, then I won't be letting you uh, have any kind of information. On, on the contrary, instead if I'm gentle and I'd like to give you something, I'm gonna be setting up uh, some green. 
uh, in that sigmoid there. And then, uh, of course, the multiplication of uh, one with my uh, internal representation is going to just give you my output. Again, uh, this I'm just talking about one unit of my uh, elements here. These are vectors, right? So they are actually multiple val values. And this one can be uh, performed for each of those values. Right now, I'm just telling about what may happen for one value, right? Then everything is independently uh, done for all the other uh, values. So they are not scalars. They are vectors, but we are just taking in consideration one of the uh, specific elements, right? So again, if I have the C output sigmoid, so if my output sigmoid here, it gives me a zero, then uh, nothing comes to you because of this equation here by the element-wise multiplication. If my sigmoid gives you a one, then you actually get the uh, hyperbolic tangent of my memory cell, specific element, right? Because this is element-wise, right? So you can choose which element I give you. Okay, so far? All right, so we go to the next gate. So this is the output gate. Are you ready? Next one? Yes? No? Yes. Ah, good. All right. Ta-da! There's so much colors. All right, so this is controlling the memory. Uh, we can perform three different operations with the memory block. And the memory block, uh, in this case, is uh, like it works in tandem, the input and the uh, don't forget uh, part. So they not, don't forget and the input blocks, they co-work in order to perform three different operations. So let's start with reset. I'd like to reset my memory. I learned so much uh, in, uh, in those you know, uh, economy, economics classes I don't even more care about now anymore. So I would like to erase all the things I learned there. It's like unnecessary or I don't know, whatever. Uh, so how do we erase memory? Uh, to erase memory, let's say I have something in my memory. Right? I have some ideas of what I was doing there which is my purple color over there. Uh, then I have some initial uh, value here of my uh, memory. So uh, here I have my memory from the previous state. And sorry, this is my actual current input. So someone is giving me some input here. So I am actually, someone is talking. I'm talking to you. I'm telling you many things. And you're like, oh my god, so many things to put in my, my head. I, I won't be remembering. So I have to remove things I had uh, stored previously, right? So this is your previous content you had in your mind, the blue one. So I'm going to put zero from the input. I don't listen. I don't listen. I can't listen because I have to match too many things in my head. And therefore, nothing comes through, right? So please don't stop listening. <laughs> Because otherwise, you don't follow anymore what I'm saying. On the other side, I had something in my mind. I was thinking, I cannot think about other things now because I'm you know, getting overwhelmed. So I actually had to clear my mind. So I say, ah, red in my um, don't forget. So that means I would like to forget, actually. And therefore, I, I write zero in that multiplication. Guess what? I sum zeros, I get zero. And I erase my memory, right? Because now my output here, it gets a 0 too. So in this case, if I put a red sigmoid for my input sigmoid, and a red sigmoid here for my uh, not forget, or gate, whatever, then I get basically a erase of the memory. OK, so far? So this is how you erase memory. Both of them have to be 0. All right, so let's do keep. Uh, I have some input here. I'm listening to something, but I don't want to get new information in. So I write a zero in this uh, input gate. So that the multiplication there, it, it stays to zero. On the other side, uh, in my don't forget, I actually have a green light, which means mm, I'd like to actually keep in mind what I was thinking about. Therefore, the multiplication of my memory by one stays uh, blue, and the summation of the uh, zero and the blue, it gets blue. So that the blue is preserved for the next step. So in this way, uh, I can preserve my previous memory for next iterations. In this case, for example, before I, I heard something, oh, I want to keep it in mind. So I can keep it in mind this way. Finally, you're actually interested in what I'm saying today to you. So you're like, ah, let's memorize this. Stuff. <coughs> let's see how we can memorize new information. So we have a green light for my sigmoid in the input. Uh, therefore, we are going to be having a green, uh, purple multiplication, right? We have purple times 1 gets purple. On the other side, 
Yeah, something your mind. No, again, those lectures in economics and whatever microeconomics. I don't know anymore what it is. I don't want to remember. It's bullshit. Whatever. Um, I just put a, a zero there in my in my sigmoid. Multiplication gets erasing the content of my memory. The summation gets through my new input. I'm talking to you new information, and then finally, I'm gonna be able to have new information in my cell. So right now, you can see now this mechanism, which I'm repeating and repeating over and over. I am arbitrarily deciding whether to store new information, to reset information, to keep my information, and whether to output or not some information you uh, store before. So right now, we have a gating mechanism in order to decide whether to perform one of those four actions, which let you remember things forever. As long as you don't reset or you add some new information, you can preserve that information in your memory without having any uh, to worry about any kind of you know forgetting things because it's like all in your working memory. So while the classic classic uh, recurring neural network may forget things because you always see new stuff, new stuff, new stuff. That like, oh my god, too much. I'm overwhelmed. In this case here, we actually have boxes where we put information whenever we care, and we can actually empty those boxes whenever we don't care anymore. Right, so that was basically it about this LSTM. So long short term memory allows you to store information for later retrieval. So if there are no other questions, because no one is raising hands, would you like to actually start doing some practice about you know playing with those recurring neural net and see some exercise and then see some you know, meat on the grill, no? I mean, sorry for the vegetarian, but I mean, I would like to... <laughs> sorry, that's so bad. In Italy we say that. Would you like to uh, get, get your hands dirty and, and, and try to figure out? Right? Are you interested? Are you excited? Yes, all right. So thank you for listening for this first part, and let's get started with the notebooks. Yay! <laughs> My computer is dead. Hello? No, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh. So go back to the repository, write this command. You're gonna fetch the latest, uh, the latest notebook from the uh, GitHub. Okay. So git reset reset dash dash hard origin master. All right. So yeah, um, repository gets updated every day. So you're gonna need to uh, run this command to get the latest. Uh, we didn't want to put everything uh, at once. Uh, yeah, so just a quick recap as um, when we were talking about the convolutional neural nets and we, we demonstrated that it's the best um, type of neural network for uh, image processing tasks because it uh, naturally uh, takes advantage of the locality um, of, of data. And uh, the same way uh, you could in principle apply one deconvolutional uh, neural net to um, process sequential data, but uh, you couldn't, uh, you wouldn't be able to memorize uh, long-term dependencies in your data. Say, for instance, you doing a time series analysis, and uh, you'll look back. Uh, basically, the number of steps to the past which you care about is uh, is rather long. Uh, the convolutional neural net would only be able to memorize uh, the size of the the kernel that you have. Um, and the, the simple recurrent neural net uh, would have trouble uh, learning long uh, sequences because uh, due to the back props through time, um, uh, if the unrolling lens is long enough, uh, the, the gradient would uh, vanish or explode, That's uh, thus um, basically making learning more difficult. And here, uh, yeah, we will look uh, at some challenges of uh, training on uh, basically uh, sequence data. Uh, so here, uh, 
the notebook uh, 01, um, it's actually not 01 in your... So let's first of all uh, actually start in the folder raw. Yeah, so what you're gonna see uh, after you run the git reset comment is uh, uh, this list of uh, notebook files. We're gonna go to the raw um, and start with Keras sequences. Uh, so first we will understand the problem, implement it uh, in Keras, and then try to port, and that will be a partially a take-home assignment for you to fully convert it to uh, PyTorch. And uh, so let's open uh, Notebook 01 right here, and also we're going to uh, need to look a little bit at the uh, sequence task, uh, tasks.py, uh, which provides the, uh, some classes which I used to generate uh, sequences for, uh, for this assignment. Uh, and we're going to look at the original experiment from uh, Hort Reiter and uh, Schmidt Huber, uh, the authors of the uh, uh, LSTM paper, uh, who basically uh, generated uh, sequences of variable lengths. That's good. <laughs> Not too dark. <laughs> uh, sequences of variable lengths. Uh, here we are basically going to be switching between different regimes. Uh, generating sequences of lengths 7 to 9, also 10 to 11, and maybe longer. Uh, and uh, they, these sequences had the fixed uh, starting and ending character, uh, the trigger characters, and uh, in between, they would be consistent of a predefined set of characters sampled at random, and those are lower, lowercase a, b, c, d. And also, some of the characters would be substituted by like special characters, which in our case, X and Y. And uh, in that way, we would uh, basically define, uh, we would also define certain rules for uh, sequence classification. In this case, uh, if we see uh, two special characters being X and X, we classify this sequence as Q. If it's X and Y, we classify it as R, Y, X, S, Y, Y, U. So let me show uh, you here. I'm going to quickly change the kernel, and we're going to start with an easy regime. Uh, here, uh, as you, after school, if you come back to that notebook, uh, here, basically here we generate the data, and this line switches the difficulty level. And the difficulty level is essentially the length of the sequences. Uh, in this case, it's the length of the sequences. And here's how our data looks. Uh, so uh, as I said, we will have uh, the character uh, sequences uh, of lengths from 7 to 9 with the fixed uh, starting and ending trigger characters. And uh, in between, there will be uh, A, B, C, and D lowercase sample at random with two special characters inserted. And so of course, uh, if our goal was initially to just classify those sequences as having X, 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 Y, Y, X, or Y, Y, we could just do it by hand with no learning. But here we would like to demonstrate that uh, LSTM is actually, and RNN is actually able, capable of learning those rules which are defined uh, by hand. And as, uh, yeah, so since we are doing here uh, sequence classification, so it's a many to one task, or sequence to vector, we will uh, encode the, we will uh, actually one code encode uh, here every character, and also for the label, we will encode the labels. Um, so for the character, it will be uh, encoded in the nine dimensional space, and for label, it's a four dimensional uh, vector because we have only four possible outcomes. So once, uh, once that is done, uh, this is how our data looks uh, in the vectorized format, which is essentially just uh, one code encoded format. Uh, the last step before we can um, proceed to training here is uh, batch it. So we need to uh, batch our data. Um, and for L LSTM or RNN, the tensors uh, which you need to prepare will typically have three dimensions. First is going to be batch size, second is going to be a temporal dimension, time sequence length, uh, and the last one would be the feature dimension. It's, uh, if you have, a, for instance, if you're analyzing 
scalar time series, the feature dimension will be one. If it's a vector time series, like every at every time step you have a two-dimensional vector, the feature dimension will be two. And yeah, so and nine is the number of time steps uh, that you actually. It doesn't have to be the full length of your time series, but it's the uh, it's the subsample of the whole sequence which you feed at, at once in one iteration <coughs> to the uh, RNN. Okay. So yeah, uh, let's spend some time to get a feeling um, about how our data looks. It's it's very important to know. Uh, the dimensions of your data. And the next step, uh, since we don't have much time, I'm going to try to go quickly. Uh, so we will skip that. Uh, this is something we will use for the next exercise. So I'm going to close it for now and proceed uh, straight to 1-1. One, one. Uh, so as I said, uh, we will be using Keras in this first uh, approximation and the simple RNN. Uh, we will ge generate some data, which is going to be the sequences uh, <coughs> generated according to the rules introduced uh, in the previous notebook. And uh, I'm, I'm assuming, well, based on the poll yesterday, at least 50% of the people are familiar with Keras. So uh, here we will see a good old uh, sequential model, Keras, which consists of a simple RNN followed by the dense layer. So we will use uh, RNN to encode uh, our sequences, and then uh, they will be uh, classified by the dense layer, followed by the uh, with the softmax activation. So softmax will output the probability distribution, uh, and <coughs> after that we'll get the maximum argmax and extra uh, and decide what type of sequence that is. Uh, so here, important point to. Emphasize is the number of hidden units. It's probably the most important parameter to fix uh, when you uh, decide uh, on your simple uh, RNN or LSTM. Uh, those can be the final numbers uh, could be decided based on like empirical trials, like hyperparameter optimization. But typically, that number would be less than the sequence than the input sequence length. So our sequence length would be seven to nine. And uh, the number of units which we start with is four. It will be typically less. So another thing is that, as you've seen, our sequences are actually not fixed lengths. Um, for deep learning frameworks which use a static graph, like TensorFlow and Keras, it's a bit of a problem. So we have to do something. And that something is padding. We uh, pad to the max length. Uh, typically, uh, we padded uh, zero padded to the max length, uh, and that's uh, what's. If you look, if you want to go into details, I'm kind of moving fast in the interest of time. Uh, there will be a place where those sequences are padded. Uh, after the padding, they will all have uh, the fixed uh, length, which is equal to the max uh, length. In PyTorch, however, who uses dynamic graph, we actually don't have to do the padding. And you will see it later, which makes it uh, quite attractive for sequence uh, learning tasks. And the number, uh, the number of uh, units, hidden units in the dense layer would be equal to number of classes for the um, number of possible sequence types. All right, so I'm going to make it smaller. Uh, and let's train it. Uh, here, the batch size we use is 32, number of hidden units is 4, and maximum number of epochs is 30. Um, all right. Let's, let's evaluate all of them. And we're good to go. So let's see how it goes. Uh, as you can see, the validation accuracy, uh, sorry, training accuracy improves, uh, and it quickly reaches. Uh, 100%, um, and the uh, validation or uh, the out-of-sample accuracy is also uh, 100%, which shows that uh, the generalization is good. Uh, we can, uh, I'm assuming you will play around more uh, with the notebooks uh, off, uh, offline, uh, but uh, basically the first place to go here is to change the difficulty and, and try to generate uh, 
hard uh, data. Uh, in this case, the sequences would be longer. And this is the regime where we uh, would expect the simple RNN to have trouble. Because uh, for short sequences like 79, uh, BPT, uh, the uh, unrolling net 79, BPTT would have no problem. We would, uh, the gradients wouldn't vanish, and we would learn. We would learn uh, everything that we have to learn. But uh, with hard, you can see that uh, RNN is actually, simple RNN is actually uh, in trouble. It cannot learn. Uh, it only uh, stops at 25% accuracy. And uh, please uh, try uh, running with LSTM. Uh, so basically, uh, you would, uh, after the class, you would, uh, after the school, you would uh, change the simple RNN uh, to LSTM and see how the result changes. We can do that here, right? It's one line. Uh, it's one line, but we kind of out of time. But okay, we, we, let's let's just try. So it's important. Yeah. So we since of references, let's just change it. Okay. So the training will be a little bit slower. There's still four units there, hidden units, maybe it's too, too little. Uh, yes, yeah, so the simple change to LSTM uh, will not help, but it should uh, help. Do you have another suggestion? Yeah, it's, it's too hard to ask. Do you have it? So typically, uh, okay, so basically. So the problem here is that the hard task we are setting there is very, very, very hard. So even uh, maybe the uh, actually the this dimension of the uh, LSTM we are using right now is too tiny in order to capture those uh, very long-term dependencies. So we have to increase like the size of the internal representation. Then it takes forever to train. That's why we usually need uh, GPUs. Uh, but basically, with medium, we may be able to see the difference between uh, using uh, just simple. Uh, recurrent neural networks and the LSTM. So one other thing here is uh, for the, for the uh, sequences, as long as we have in the hard representation, we uh, wouldn't want to feed it all at once. So right now what we do is we take uh, the sequences, we add it to the max, and we feed it all at once. Uh, this is not the ideal kind of scenario to, load, uh, to learn the long sequences. We want to uh, feed it in sub-sequences. Uh, this is something we will do for the echo exercise. We define the truncated length of the sequence, and we feed it uh, in uh, smaller subsequences, maybe of length uh, 20. And uh, the, the key thing here to keep in mind is that we don't uh, reset states. Uh, as Alfredo was saying, we have uh, in uh, LSTM, for, for simple RNA, actually it shouldn't matter, but for LSTM, uh, we have the input uh, for get gate uh, or non forget gate, gate uh, and output gate, uh, which basically uses, uh, we can think of it as using sigmoid uh, uh, for the input and uh, for get gate to decide which, mem uh, which inputs to add and which memories to flush, and then tunch uh, to decide which uh, components to output. And uh, we won't uh, reset the states uh, of the cell uh, between uh, those subsequences, but we will reset at the end of the uh, task. 
so just here, let's try it with uh, medium just real quick and see if it does better. With a simple person. Simple, simple. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't actually going to speak. Yeah, I think for for this case, even with moderate, with moderate, we have to feed the subsequences uh, as well. All right. Uh, so let's, uh, in the interest of time, let's proceed with the next exercise and. Okay, so for the next exercise, uh, we will uh, look at the sequence echoing. So basically, we will have uh, a sequence consistent of uh, zeros and ones uh, of a total length of 20,000. And uh, basically, uh, our task is to output uh, basically a sequence delay by a certain... Um, an interval. Uh, here, uh, the twenty uh, the, with the sequence length as long as twenty thousand, and in, and actually uh, even with uh, far shorter um, uh, sequences, uh, simple RNNs or even LSTMs would uh, have a problem. Uh, that's why uh, basically here we define the truncated lens. And uh, this is what uh, is called the stateful training in um, Keras. Actually, yeah, that's what uh, needs to be done in the previous exercise. Uh, so, which means that uh, given Which means that given um, let's say a few long sequences, the first thing we do is we pad it to the max, to the max lens. Uh, we don't feed it all at once. And here uh, we will be batching uh, different sequences. It's important to not batch. Uh, different subsets of the single sequence in the same batch because uh, they have uh, temporal uh, information that needs to know. So uh, one sequence should say, uh, stay as one. Um, and we will split it into subsequences like that. Uh, it's better if it's a divider without... A, uh, it's better if it's a multiple of the total lens. Uh, so say uh, the total lens has... Uh, is 100 time steps, we would choose a subsequence length of 25, and we would have uh, four subsequences. All right, uh, important point here is, uh, let's say uh, our next batch, so what we would feed to uh, the neural network is uh, that tensor, 
from here to here, and the next on the next step we would feed this tensor. But we wouldn't reset states uh, in between. Here we wouldn't reset st states in between, and here we wouldn't uh, reset states uh, as well. Um, and then as we feed the next batch here, we would reset states here. Reset uh, states of the uh, RNA. All right. Um, so yeah, so this is a different task. Is this is a many-to-many -many task? And let's uh, before we start, let's look at uh, how our data looks. Uh, so here you you see uh, basically a sequence of zeros and ones. Uh, it's a very long sequence, a total length of twenty thousand, and it's uh, actually the the output sequence is the same as the input sequence. You can see that zero one 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 zero one starting with some uh, step, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, and so on. It's the same sequence. Uh, so next, we batch it. Uh, so the raw input uh, shape is 5 to 20,000. And the batched input shape is uh, again, as in the previous case, it's a batch size sequence length, uh, in this case, truncated sequence length and the uh, feature dimension. Uh, since this is a uh, one-dimensional scalar series, uh, the feature dimension is going to be one. And uh, the time steps is the truncated lens. The 10 is a truncated lens right here. Is as much we're going to be feeding to, neural, uh, uh, to RNN at once. Uh, so once we are uh, like familiar, familiarized ourselves with the um, data, let's proceed with uh, to the notebook one two, and uh, here we generate data. First, uh, we define a model here, a sequential model consisting of a simple RNN uh, followed by the time distributed uh, dense layer. So uh, the time distributed dense layer uh, is something that. Uh, uh, define the layer wrapper defined in Keras. It will basically, uh, in the end of the day, it will apply a dense transformation with the sigmoid activation in one hidden unit to every temporal slice. Uh, to every temporal slice, uh, we will return sequences. So, uh, as you know, as you, um, Alfredo was explaining, we have uh, the LSTM cell or uh, simple RNN will output uh, a sequence. And for classification tasks, we, only, we typically only take the last state, the very last state of that sequence. For sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence learning, we would like to retain the whole sequence. And we can't apply the dense uh, fully connected layer to the whole sequence. Uh, so uh, we have to uh, apply it to every uh, temporal slice. Uh, the stateful term here uh, means exactly exactly this. And uh, the statefulness is actually a key to fix uh, the first exercise uh, for the case of longer sequences. Uh, we would feed it in some sequences of the total sequence without resetting states in between. Uh, echo, echo step here is uh, basically by how much we uh, delay the output sequence. Uh, as you remember, uh, when we were looking at the data, which is the sequence of zeros and ones, the output sequence will be the echo, meaning identically the same sequence as the input, but delayed by a certain number of steps. And the echo step uh, defines that delay. This means it, the network has to actually learn a way of representing and keep in memory whatever it has seen for the previous, I don't know, in this case, three steps. 
so that it's able to reproduce the sequence after a bit, right? So if you uh, elongate that echo step to 10 uh, units, the uh, recurrent neural network has to figure, an out, figure out a way of uh, having a compact representation of 10 symbols in order to then start spitting out that same sequence, you know, after 10 uh, intervals, right? So we have, again, a compression of a sequence into inter an internal representation, which keeps being updated over and over the time. And then it starts uh, re-expanding that, com that condensed representation into a sequence again. Uh, so as you can see uh, with this setup, which is an easy setup, again, uh, even simple recurrent neural net is able to uh, learn that uh, representation. Uh, we get 92 something percent on the train set and uh, the 100 percent uh, on the test set. Uh, yeah, there's few ways to make it uh, more difficult. Is first of all, uh, for instance, increasing uh, truncated lens. So strictly speaking, one doesn't have to do that. But uh, just to demonstrate, uh, basically, the truncated lens uh, controls the, the size of uh, this block, the size of subsequences which are fed uh, at once to the RNN or LSTM. Uh, 50 might not be enough, actually. Let's, let's Increase the eco steps and it works. Yeah, so the 50 is uh, good enough. Uh, let's try to uh, increase the eco step. Well, definitely, if the eco step is larger than truncated lens, uh, we're going to be in trouble. So, uh, so right now, by choosing a eco step which is way larger than the truncating length, then the network can best guess is going to just to be uh, randomly choosing a zero or a one, as we as we have seen. As we have seen, those uh, sequences are made of binary uh, digits, and therefore uh, the best guess, if you don't know, is just to have a random number. And given that you have a 50% of chance of having a five, a zero, or a one, then the overall accuracy is going to be just 50%. You just get half of the time. So if you just output all ones, then you get half of the uh, digits correct. So instead of having like equal step of three, we can go uh, to six. Maybe we're going to see uh, before we were able to uh, correctly. Uh, you know, memorize those kind of sequences because you know how many. Hold on. So hidden hidden units of four. Uh, how many? Uh, how what is the length of uh, steps you can memorize? So with four, uh, what is two to the power of four? What is four to the power of two? It's the same, right? Sixteen. Okay, it's a joke. Don't. Worry. <laughs> All right. Never mind. So you can uh, up to sixteen. Four units. Four units will be able to memorize up to sixteen uh, elements, right? So anything that is below sixteen, I expect to achieve a perhaps uh, accuracy of one hundred percent. But again, as we have seen now, from going from three to six, actually this network doesn't uh, manage to achieve the hundred uh, percent. If you are switching now to LSTM, instead we're going to be able to see that it's very uh, easy to have long-term dependencies, even, you know, really, really long, uh, like up to the um, even 20, you know, if you have the, uh, what the, the truncated, uh, batch, truncated length of 20. So right now we switch to the LSTM, and we're going to see uh, what was before, 86%, right, the accuracy. Uh, let's see now what it gets. Uh, we are 57. Uh, before it was three uh, truncated length, uh, tr three eco steps, so it was hundred. Then we switched to six, it, it went down to eighty-seven. Uh, now we switch to LSTM with six. with six, and you should 
perform better than the RNN. Let's see. To be fair, uh, the LSTM is using four times more parameters than the yeah, RNN. So, uh, I was going to say the LSTM has uh, a lot more parameters than the simple RNN, so uh, it's not quite a fair comparison to, to train it for uh, the same number of epochs. So, uh, yeah, we can um, run it for 10 epochs. But, yeah, so the main um, point here uh, is uh, we don't feed the whole sequences at once. But we uh, split it into subsequences of truncated lens, and we feed it uh, sequentially, without resetting the states uh, of the uh, of the LSTM in between. In fact, for simple RNN, it there is no inner cell, so the, uh, the there is no carried state in the memory which it memorizes. So uh, that approach uh, wouldn't work as successful, although. Reducing the uh, truncated lens would uh, give an advantage. Uh, and the last thing, uh, while it's running, uh, the last thing uh, we'll try to go over uh, well quicker than we should, uh, really is how to re-implement that all in PyTorch. And uh, part of that will be given as a take-home exercise for you to play with. Um, one good uh, thing about PyTorch is that it has dynamic graph, which means we won't have to uh, actually do uh, padding of sequences, and we won't have to do use time-distributed uh, layer. It's improving, but very slowly. Uh, one other thing we could try is, of course, changing the learning rate. But okay, but well, we're gonna go to my torch. All right. So the PyTorch exercise is the is in the main uh, section here. Uh, we're not gonna touch the 081 and 082 because this is just uh, describes the data. In one case, it's the um, manually generated sequences with a certain rule encoded, uh, like the XX, uh, R, X, Y, Q, uh, and so on. And we're going to uh, jump straight to the temporal um, sequence here. Um, so we start by importing the data. The, the data generator is not changed here, uh, and the difficulty is the same. Uh, the neural network is, again, defined uh, by a class derived from an N module here uh, with a, a constructor. Um, within a constructor, we define uh, the logic uh, of our neural network, which consists of the RNN, and uh, followed by the linear layer. Uh, so the RNN will take uh, three parameters here. Uh, the input size, which is the length of the sequence uh, in this case, uh, the RNN hidden size, which we fix manually uh, to be four in the beginning. Uh, the number of layers of the neural network uh, will be uh, one uh, in this case, and we can specify the nonlinearity used in the RNN. Uh, if you want consistencies, consistency of the batch dimensions uh, with Keras, you use a batch first true, which would put the batch dimension as a first. So you will have batch size, sequence length, and uh, feature dimension. Otherwise, by default, batch size will be a, a second dimension. Uh, and the linear is just a linear fine layer uh, from the hidden size to the output size. Uh, yeah, and we use a, a softmax output uh, activation. Potentially, you can also use the uh, NN dot sequential uh, constructor. So the same way we have seen uh, before with Keras, uh, it can also be done with PyTorch whenever you have like a simple se sequence of uh, blocks, right? So that is the more versatile way of creating a network, a model. But otherwise, you can simply use the pre-made uh, dot, dot, NN dot uh, sequential. Uh, so one quick look at the training loop. Uh, there is no uh, s uh, need to define a training loop in Keras because we use estimator. And all we do is we pass the parameters and call uh, dot fit. 
Uh, here, uh, you will see uh, the like a usual structure for all training loops uh, in, uh, in PyTorch. Model train will simply uh, set certain parameters for the layers which are dependent, which are different between training and test phase, like, for instance, dropout and batch normalization. Uh, then uh, we see uh, the regular batch loop over the training set. You can use, uh, for instance, if, if your data comes as a generator, you can use uh, enumerate and uh, take the data and target directly in the for loop. Here, I'm doing it uh, with a range. Uh, finally, since our data comes initially as a set of NumPy arrays, uh, we have to convert it to tor torch tensors uh, using from NumPy function and then specify the uh, precision of the, of the tensor. Um, to device, we'll uh, basically place it to uh, a CUDA, to GPU um, device if you have one. Uh, finally, uh, optimizer zero graph every step because we accumulate uh, gradients uh, for each weight every uh, mini batch iteration. Uh, this is the forward pass, which will return us a prediction. Uh, in case of RNN, uh, it can also return a hidden state if we ask for it, as you will see in the next step. Uh, the loss, uh, this is the loss calculation in the backward. Uh, we'll do the back prop, and finally the weight update uh, with the um, yeah, we, you know, we, we publish it. What we can do is, because I want to make sure that, that we get to the next piece, which includes the survey and the reimbursement stuff, but anybody who doesn't need to leave immediately, I don't know what time you guys have to take off, we can, uh, can switch back to those. I need like 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so I thought he would I'm, finish earlier. They're probably kind of hungry, right? Yeah. Not had enough food so far, but there, there are sort of cookies out here, so... Uh, but at 11, I really should start the next stuff. So what do you want to do? You want to break for cookies for 10 minutes? Or continue for here for another 10, 15 minutes? Let's continue. We'll end it later. Yeah, we can oh. continue. Thanks. Okay. So we go to 11, and then we'll switch to the... <laughs> they like him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for being slow. He will be our cookie. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, one thing here is, um, so these uh, parts of the training loop will all look almost exactly the same uh, for all models. Uh, the some difference will be, uh, for, for instance, for RNN when you return the hidden state. Uh, I will show you in the next example. Uh, here is the accuracy calculation. Um, so in Keras, you don't actually have to specify how you calculate the accuracy. You just have to say metrics equals accuracy. And it will decide, based on the uh, output activation, how it should uh, calculate accuracy for you. So basically, PyTorch, uh, in this sense, is a lot lower level, because you actually have to think what you're doing. Uh, in this case, uh, the output activation is a softmax. Uh, means it will output the vector of the floating point vector of probabilities. And uh, then to decide, actually, well, we are doing sequence classification here. To decide which class the sequence belongs to, we have to take the uh, identify the index corresponding to the maximum probability. Uh, and here we do exactly the same, except uh, the torch max, it will return both an index, and uh, we can ask to uh, retain the value by keeping true, and then we pick. Uh, finally, we check uh, where the target, the truth value, corresponds to the predicted value by pred.acuTarget. Uh, view as pred, uh, basically, the, the dimension of the target will be the batch size times the feature dimension, right? So in this case, it's going to be 32 and 4. The batch size is 32, and 4 is the number of possible output classes. Um, and the um, prediction will have dimension 32, one four. Uh, so uh, we will have to reshape it to uh, match the dimension of the target before comparing. After that, we sum it, uh, sum it throughout the batch and take the item to get the scalar uh, from the uh, torch tensor. Uh, so the nothing special in the test loop. Uh, only thing that remember to call model eval in the beginning of the test loop. It will Basically, uh, um, for uh, layers like uh, dropout and batch normalization, those are not used in the test phase, so it will disable those. Uh, finally, use torch no grad in the PyTorch version 04 and later. Uh, this is uh, basically, it, 
courses uh, graph not to be created for the for the inference uh, or prediction stage, which saves time. Um, in the earlier versions, uh, we would use like volatile variables and other stuff. Okay, so I actually already uh, so that that part uh, will um, not change here. I'm constructing the model, defining the loss, which is cross entropy loss because we have multi class. Uh, classification here, uh, Eremos prop, you can use anything else, there is Adam. Um, everything looks the same. Uh, and here would be our epochs loop, where we would call the train method uh, every epoch, and actually we would do the testing only once in the end of the um, number of max epochs. But typically the way uh, we do the, the best approach would be to run the validation um, step after each epoch, which we uh, don't do uh, in this case. And finally, the accuracy is just a simple uh, division of the number, the ratio of the number of total correct uh, to the train size, and we want it to be a float, so I'm casting. That's all. All right, here we also got almost 96%, uh, to almost 200%. Remember, for the easy setting, in um, uh, Keras, we got 100% uh, very easily. And I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise to find what is actually not allowing it to uh, get 100% uh, accuracy. And if you find, uh, please let us know. And Alfredo, Alfredo will tweet uh, about the winner. <laughs> send a pull request, OK? And for, yeah, of course, send a pull request. And so, finally, the last notebook is 084 Eco Experiments. Uh, so here, uh, basically, all the same steps, we get the data. Uh, which is defined in the sequence data.py. Uh, then we define a model, which in this case, uh, the minor difference will be uh, we're still going to start with the simple RNN. Um, and then uh, in the course of exercise, you can um, play around with L LSTM or maybe GRU as well. Uh, it will contain, it consists of only one uh, RNN layer and followed by the uh, linear layer with the uh, sigmoid output activation. This is a, uh, in this case, it's a binary classification task. So we use uh, sigmoid out output activation. And we will compare the output value, whether it's closer to 1 or close to 0. Um, the only uh, distinctive thing here, since we are doing stateful training, remember, uh, in Keras we said we want to do stateful training, means we don't want to feed uh, the whole sequence all at once, but we want to split it into subsequences and uh, feed it uh, sequential without resetting state every time. Uh, corresponding to that picture. Uh, to do that, uh, we need to return the hidden state. We need to return the output state and the hidden state of the RNN, and we would feed it uh, well recursively on the next step. So that's what happens um, here. And also, I kind uh, of took uh, some time to initialize the hidden layer. Although we could use the default initialization, that strictly speaking. Uh, it's not required, but if you want to train your neural network faster, it's important to pay attention to the initialization. Uh, in Keras, those things would uh, typically be done for free. Uh, I'm, I'm, when I say for free, I mean there is meaningful defaults. So uh, the only difference in the training loop uh, compared to the previous case would be uh, in this line. When we do the forward pass, we also return the hidden state. And we feed it in the next mini batch iteration as an input to uh, model beta. Uh, for the first iteration, it uses the randomly initialized uh, values. Uh, finally, the calculate accuracy differently. This is what I uh, mentioned when we use Keras, we just say ac uh, metrics equals accuracy, and it will decide what accuracy typically. Uh, and uh, here, since in the previous case, we used uh, Softmax, so we had to use for maximum argument. 
uh, and then match uh, the predicted category. And here we have a sigmoid, so we have to look whether it's above 0.5 or less, and then compare, um, compare it to the target. And sum over all the, the entire batch. And uh, again, in the test, we'll uh, use a torsional graph uh, context uh, manager to not to force not um, creating the graph uh, in the inference stage, and that saves a lot a lot of time. And uh, as you will see that uh, basically the default implementation will be a lot slower. And uh, that's one more task maybe for some, for uh, to, to figure out what it actually makes it slower in this case. Uh, because uh, to figure that out, we would have to look at the uh, actual Keras source code implementation uh, and see uh, what is it using for uh, improving the uh, performance. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's all I have. The, on the only thing is for the, the first exercise when we do the sequence uh, classification um, to convert uh, the training from feeding the entire padded sequence all uh, in once to the stateful training, uh, we would have to, uh, in the Keras version, we would have to uh, When we construct the model, we would have to say stateful uh, stateful true, and we would have to change uh, the batch generator to feed uh, the data in um, subsequences. Uh, similarly, uh, here in the torch version. Uh, we would um, return the hidden state here, and we would pass it uh, recursively. So it's like four. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, that, that's all uh, for me.